Hello, everyone. Um, and now let's see if I've set this up right and I haven't goofed it. <gasps> okay, we are we are video live. And now audio for Jay as well. Uh, welcome everyone to a rare Tuesday stream, which you will probably be seeing more of. And uh, and also uh, the fabulous J Dragon, um, who I, I gotta tell you guys, I'm super excited to, for this chat um, because um, I, I'm just I'm just very excited. Um, <laughs> I'm very flattered. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, Pat. It's good to be here. Thank you for inviting me into the blanket fort this fine Tuesday <laughs> afternoon. Um, and I just saw somebody here. Uh, in the chat say, I first heard about Wanderhorn on this stream a few weeks ago, and now they are actually on episode three of the one-shot playthrough, um, uh, which, how weird is it? Like, and, and uh, not, to, not to take us away, but like I, I brought <laughs> one of my many copies of Wanderhorn to be close enough to hold it up lovingly. Um, I should have done that. I'm uh, such a fool. That's okay. I've got I've got it here. I've got multiple copies. <laughs> You've got that I will hold up. Plenty, yeah. Yep. And uh, uh, these are just my my personal copies. I keep close at hand, but uh, I will admit, other like all my other people that I like gaming with have known about you for ages. But I live under a rock, and I'm old, and uh, and so. Uh, it was actually James who gave me a copy of Wander Home uh, and, and is like, I think you might like this for your boys. And I, and I, I, I tell you, and it, it, actually, can we, I meant to ask you about this before mm -hmm. we went live, but then we talked about other things. <laughs> um, but like, can I, because uh, I'm going to ask you to introduce yourself in a second, but if you're okay with it, can I... Can I just sort of, it's not even an introduction. I just sort of want to gush about some of your work. I'm going to establish your bona fides here. I I can, there's no part of me that can say no to someone uh, being really <laughs> nice to me. I, 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 I'm, I'm a simple creature, please. Yes. <laughs> um, you know, I, I stumbled onto this um, because uh, uh, my, my friend uh, and amazing game doer, James D'Amato, uh, gave it to me as a present. And straight up, I flipped through it, and I'm like, okay, okay, okay. And even I, who I am not art-focused in these projects, even I was like, oh, okay. But, and and then I, also, I don't read introductions. Uh, I actually mm -hmm. write introductions in which I talk about the fact that I don't like introductions. <laughs> Uh, but <laughs> it's different when the intro is written by the person who's producing the work. Mm -hmm. I read the intro. I read about the land of, uh, and I, I'm going to now. I'm There's no say, correct way to say it. There's no correct way to say it. Hey, uh, I love the AE. I'm a huge fan of that. Um, mm -hmm. I read it. And I, as I read it, I would read a couple of paragraphs and kind of put the book down the same way that I read like the Tao Te Ching, because you can't just pound down the Tao Te Ching. You're like, I got to think about this for a second. This is wild. And it's, it, it's so different. And I appreciate it so much that I have, like, I would be on other calls with friends and I'm like, we have to stop talking about what we're talking about now. And I'm going to read you some parts of this game book, even though you're not a gamer. Like, I just, you're going to listen to this. Or if you are a gamer, you're going to, everybody has to listen to this. And then, um, and then I, I did it to the people on stream here at least once or twice. Um, so, um, but everybody but i'd actually experienced your work before that because i listened to the one shot version of sleep away oh yeah mm -hmm. which um has one of my absolute favorite people that i cannot be cool about uh brendan lee mulligan uh playing in there well Brennan Lee Mulligan was my summer camp counselor when I was a kid. Oh shit! Which is, which, which is the which is the sleepaway time, which is the 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 him playing sleepaway, which is a game about a summer camp, 
and I learned, so I, I for, just con for quick context on that side story, I went to a summer camp where I learned how to LARP and Brennan taught me how to LARP. And like, I was like, I remember being 12 years old and getting like lost in the mud and like losing my sandals and going to him. And he's in this pavilion that's been turned into this palace of light. And he's this like God of air. And he like helps me find my oh, shoes. Jesus. Um, so Brennan, Brennan is a, is a, Brennan, Brennan is like, um, you know, your older cousin who is like the cool older cousin, <laughs> like who's like, or like maybe the, like the young aunt slash uncle who's like, Brennan's kind of that figure in my life. Oh, so man. that's that connection. That was the sleepaway pull in. And I'm really glad that that, that was, I think like J part of why James did the, the sleepaway podcast, the one shot was like being able to tag in a bunch of folks who were connected to my old summer camp in some way, which is very sweet of it, him. It was, it was wild. So how about this? Cause I want to get into all these stories, but first I should say, mm -hmm. welcome chat. Um, we have a guest today, so I'm not saying that normally you're not great, but like I sort of side eye my kids when we have somebody over for dinner, that rare, you know, in the times of COVID, somebody comes over for dinner and I'm like, I'm, I'm going to say to you what I try to imply to them. And I'm like, can you just be cool like you normally are? I don't need you to be special fancy. <laughs> just be your regular cool selves. Don't. Don't show off by being naughty for my cool guest here. Uh, <laughs> and I, I trust you guys. I trust you guys. But, you know, one of one of the things that I love is when somebody does come to visit. It was really flattering. Mary Robinette Kowal swung by my house a year ago, which in, in this day and age and where I live, it's very strange. But she was going from one place mm -hmm. to another. Got to meet my kids for the first time in years. And when they... And when they wandered off with their mom, then she looked at me and she's like, they're very good. What do you pay them? And 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 her delivery is so impeccable that I was like, I'm like, what what do you uh what do you mean? And they're like, well, they're obviously plants that are just designed to make you look like a good dad because they're amazing kids. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, they are my heart's delight, and I'm as proud of them as I'm proud of anything <laughs> in the world. But I will say, chat, a close second place is how I feel about this little community where you are an island of kindness in the in like midden of the Internet. You, you're the opposite of the Internet here. Um, so just be just continue to be that. No pressure. And uh, uh, but I feel the same way when a lot of people wander in here and they're like, oh, my God, your chat like asks really good questions and they type like a paragraph worth worth of like carefully mm -hmm. worded, considerate, thoughtful mm -hmm. response. So that's all I'm asking for, Chad, is for you to be stunning and amazing. Um want my chat to be horrible. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, God. Oh, you're my, undoing. I want my, if you're in my fan base, if you're here because of me, no, 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 that's not true. No, I want you to be nice too. I just, I want you to be like, um, like the, like the, the cool old, I want you to be the cool teens. Like, if, like I want you to like, I want you to like take, take Pat's chat and like teach them how to smoke weed when no one's looking. No, oh my good parenting. Oh. <laughs> Oh, this is great. Don't be rowdy, just, you know, <laughs> on the slide. <laughs> so uh, now can you do, like, just briefly introduce yourself however you like, however you'd like uh, the folks here to know you, um, or how you like to, to present yourself, and then we'll get into talking about your game. Yeah, hi, um, I'm Jay Dragon. Um, I don't use pronouns, I just use my name. Um, uh, da -da, although, you know, they, them is fine on occasion. Um, uh, da -da -da, I am the editorial director at Possum Creek Games, and I am a game designer and uh, publisher. Um, you might know me <laughs> from Sleep Away or Wander Home, or the I am one of the writers for the upcoming Yuseba's Bed and Breakfast, which is on Indiegogo right now. Uh, IGG.me slash AT slash Yuseba's. Um, and... Yeah, I'm also just kind of like a, a, a queer weirdo who lives by the creek in the woods and, uh, you know, like, is a local figure at my local coffee shop, which is all you can really ask to be. Yeah, right. Those are the those are the good old days. Um, I am jealous of your creek. Um, I've always wanted, I, I have lived in the woods um, mm -hmm. and small town Wisconsin, even in the middle of town, is not far from being in the woods. 
Um, yeah, do we have a, a command with the uh, with the link? Um, I don't think I can type the link in because it's uh, actually uh, I'm not a user, but it's, this I'm sure is mod can. this is how good my my chat is. I do not even have to restrict uh, restrict links, uh, but it's already in there. Um, oh, well, great, amazing. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's the game. Uh, that that we're gonna get to because I I can't entirely gush about that yet because I've only read little bits and pieces. Um, oh, you have a oh, that's so sweet. Well, I, I love that. I am uh, I, as I said, I'm old, so I mm -hmm. uh, I need a, a physical copy to interact with. Or, I have. Yeah. I left I left it in the other room, but I have this purple binder that's my copy of ESA Buzz that I use for the legacy playtesting because oh. it needs stickers and stuff, you know, like if I'm gonna play test it proper like. Yeah. So I have this big purple binder that's just full of like glue and tape and oh, paper. That's a great artifact. That yeah, that'll be a treasure someday. <laughs> yep. Yep. I mean, as uh, as somebody who has kept some of the manuscripts from like the very first beta reads of like my first book, mm -hmm. you know, those, Oh my mm -hmm. God, those are so old, but also it's like, there's some interesting notes there. And, you know, someday in the future, maybe some mm -hmm. poor purposeless grad student can like track the progress of this book. Um, don't ever do that in the future. Anyone <laughs> do something better. It's with all your right. Life. This is, this is ephemeral media. So the grad students can't hear you. Yeah. <laughs> You'll uh, have to write that one down. <laughs> But uh, um, so uh, to, to continue here, just to sort of lead up. Um, and uh, so um, my, my first experience was hearing your game played by, again, some of the best in the business. You know, James is amazing. Uh, Brennan is, is like a, I don't know, there should be a different word for people like, Brennan Lee Mulligan and Lin Manuel Miranda and like Neil Gaiman, I think of them as kind of unicorns, where mm -hmm. they're just these magical creatures who like bring such delight to whatever they do. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But um, what I will say about that one, as somebody who like went to church camp once or twice, but you're like, oh yeah, I went to a camp to learn how to LARP, and I'm like, part of me is like. I'm happy for you people. But also, like, I got church camp and they thought I was a misanthrope at best and I was worshiping the devil for playing D&D. &D. And I do not want that experience for anyone. But sometimes, you know, it's hard not to go back into that, uh, what an anthropologists sort of colloquially referred to as a kick-ass, kiss-ass situation where you go through a difficult period to graduate into maturity, whether it be like you have to get your PhD and now you're on the inside and then you make, then you got to turn around and make everyone else's experience as miserable as yours. That is not the way to the future, everyone. That is not the way to be a good member of society. But, you know, and that's where the whole like some classic geek behavior comes from. It's like, you're not a real comic fan because you didn't love mm -hmm. it back when everyone hated it and you don't know it like mm -hmm. I knew it. But uh, mm -hmm. so I, I am happy for you, but I'm, I'm dealing with the twinge of like, what would my life have been like if I could have gone to LARP camp? Like, uh, but what I will say if it, is- If it helps at all, if it helps at all, Sleepaway is very autobiographical, so- <laughs> Do do you take the the shape shifting <laughs> skin stealing monster with a grain of salt? Um. I, I will say one of the things I loved and that I immediately brought to my kids is you know mm -hmm. I'm trying to help them be better about gender than I grew up being. Like I I really mm -hmm. struggle I with with doing it appropriately. It's like breaking all these decades long habits, and they're mm -hmm. better at it. But like deconstructing the binary, the genders that people could select in sleep away like rocks on a mountain and um you know and and I listened to that and I'm like pedagogically like as a teacher and mm -hmm. and that's what really like rings the bell in my mm -hmm. heart for wander home too I'm like I'm like 
like, this is so smart. Like, this is, like, we learn from stories and, and like, and of course, the engagement you get from an RPG and creating a character is so real mm -hmm. and so so tangible and so powerfully affecting mm -hmm. and and i'm like here you are you're forcing people to choose a gender that is like the most ephemeral of concepts and i brought it to the boys and they're like and they're like i think my littler was like i think i am a sleepy fox and i'm like my little man like, what's he? And you're right there. I'm saying my little man, right? But mm -hmm. I'm like, mm -hmm. I'm like, he, I'm like, Sleepy Fox sounds great, you know? Um, mm -hmm. And my older mm -hmm. one is like, I think I am Quiet Bunny. And I'm like, you are Quiet Bunny, you know? Right, yeah. right. At, at least right now. Mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. like, just that would have been enough to really earn me the love of that, even though the game itself, you know, and going to a camp, um, that was it's really outside my experience wander home again is is magical um and i could talk about that for for a week but i mm. instead what i'm hoping to do um can can i learn from you because it used to be if somebody mm -hmm. was a was a role player you knew where they started because mm -hmm you know role playing it only existed for so long and we all grew up in the basement and we all played D&D &D. Mm -hmm. and then some of us migrated and learned other things but mm -hmm. that I'm guessing that isn't true for you like how did you come into this world yeah so um I started playing tabletop role playing when I was 18 but I started role playing like you know like certainly most kids play on the playground and they they role play on the playground and they build characters and they tell stories and they take the non-mechanical systems that surround their lives and they utilize those to play games right like house is a game that instead of using a system from a book uses a system from the world around them so yeah. kids play role playing games mechanically they do that as kids um so i did i did that i played a lot of superheroes and super villains um when I was uh, 12, I went to LARP camp and I spent basically a decade LARPing before, you know, like at least six years LARPing before I ever touched uh, d and I tried like a little bit of 3.5 and I, I was just so like, I was just like, oh, this is so like, when I got to Dungeons and Dragons and when I got to tabletop role playing, it took me a little to be convinced that these were real games. Right. Because, because when I encountered Dungeons and Dragons, it was like, oh, I'm not somatically living out my experiences i'm having to narrate this story where's the physical component where's the reality where's the truth it's just a story and then i was like wait hold on there's actually okay this is actually pretty cool but i, I had initial resistance and then i also you know like if my as one chat chatter pointed out i've got anime i've got some miyazaki posters on my walls i you know was into you know tumblr and ask blog culture and fandom role play and all sorts of things that i'm still a little too embarrassed <laughs> to describe fully but you know if anyone if anyone grew up at the kind of millennial zoomer cusp that i am i'm sure you also kind of moved in those spaces um and then i finally i played one game of fourth edition dungeons and dragons and then i played monster hearts and I played a lot of Monster Hearts, which is by Every Alder and is a great game if you're not familiar. Um, that was to the chat. I um, and then I ran D and D through college, and I was like, I you know running D and D is fine. It's an okay system. It's the game my friends will play, but I'm sure I can do better than this. And <laughs> I think in I like to joke that I got started because in 2018, uh, I wrote a 200 word RPG for a contest, and the one Reddit comment on it was that it wasn't a game. And that spite has fueled. <laughs> um, oh, I, and, I, I, and to this day, every single thing I make, there will always be someone telling me that it's not a role playing game, like clockwork. Like there will always be one person in the comments who I can find. And that's, you know, that's that's good. I like that. I was going to say, honest. so long as you can keep mm -hmm. that as, as a sustainable fuel source, I, I realized mm -hmm early on that sort of the casual disdain of my friends, you know, over the, mm -hmm. the more than a decade I worked on my first book where they're like, yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, it was just sort of like gentle. Yeah. We know you're working on your thing, Pat. And they'd read mm -hmm. parts of it or all of it, mm -hmm. 
but I was still like, mm-hmm. I was still like, no, like, like the fact that they were dismissive of it kind of juiced me up. Um, mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. interestingly, like it then suddenly like, that's not really sustainable because mm-hmm. if mm-hmm. that's the only, if that's the main thing keeping you going, as soon as you meet with success, the rugs pulled out from underneath you. Because, uh, and then you start to self sabotage, yeah, yeah. Um, but Mm -hmm. the uh, uh, what I want to say when you said you could do better, um, Mm -hmm. what was it if you can remember, like, what was it Mm -hmm. that kind of that kind of chapped your ass about the system if you can remember? I, I think for me, the thing with with Dungeons and Dragons, the thing that kind of prompted me to to take my own path was um it had a very specific worldview yeah um and the worldview felt uh very misaligned with my own and so the stories i would tell through it always felt um dissonant and i i i confess there are uh things about dungeons and dragons which i cannot hope to do better i think that it's it's culture of play is certainly impressive but it was this feeling of this is a world which believes that individual people are only reducible to how people see them and how they hurt others that yeah. the the that the the most important thing one can do in the world is self-actualize through violence um and that uh it is kind of at its core uh, a game with a very misanthropic perspective <laughs> yeah. um and also, I um, don't like math very much. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I just got really tired of adding lots of little numbers together. Um, and I, <laughs> I mean, you know, I would not I would not say it is ultimately spite that motivates me. I think that it was also, um, you know, when you write LARPs for a decade, right? Because that was that was, you know, that was kind of my my core when it came to game writing. Um, and then I had to kind of learn to adjust from the very specific art of writing a large LARP for 80 people yeah. to the much more personal act of writing a game for, for five people, but any random five people. Um, and a lot of that, I think, came out of um, this kind of, I don't know, the, 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 there was, I think it was not, I, I want to clarify it was not just spite. I think that, that I do, there is kind of this this deep love for like the magical act of building this space together. And it was like the appeal of a tabletop role-playing game was that instead of having to burn myself out facilitating this one event that would happen and then never happen again, I could instead create an artifact which could kind of take that spark and bring it elsewhere and like transmit it and kind of without me. And that felt very liberating. And also I think what is appealing about writing a book, I would imagine. Yeah. Uh, a novel. Yeah, that's that's a big piece of it. I, it's funny that I don't think of it because I played D and D early, but then, you know, and again, this shows, you know, how how long ago it was. Like it used to be, you were either like wildly indie, you know, or mm-hmm. you played D and D. There were there were a few other games. Mm-hmm. It was D and D, and then the first mm-hmm. new thing on the scene was uh, Vampire, which these mm-hmm. days is very dated, but in those days was like, oh, it's literally called the storyteller system. Mm -hmm. Um, And Mm -hmm. it is a little more designed for narrative. And the system supports that particular narrative. Um, But but then I LARPed, I did vampire LARP. So what what system did you guys use? Was it Mind's Eye? We did not use a system. We we had our, there's a, I could, I don't want to derail this conversation into the bizarre peculiarities of the LARP capsule that was the summer campaign yeah. that, but basically it's it's a, an adaptation of a thing that was developed by some students of the guy who invented original play that started at the Omega Institute in the okay. 80s and became kind of its own separate branch of LARP disconnected from any of the major traditions wow, and cool. it's kind of starting to integrate itself by taking stuff from some Scandinavian LARP, but is still very different than what the American Dang. scene is doing. Generally. We'll have you on later to talk about <laughs> yes. just LARP. Um, I, 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 I literally, I, w- I want you to know that because of that, I do tabletop, I don't talk about LARP theory at all. And so, and but I, I am, that was my start. And so I've got all these like, this, this deep set, you know, like forbidden knowledge that I only bust out like in, you know, where it's like, I feel like, I feel like with tabletop, I always feel a little 
um, clumsy. Like I don't quite know the history, but then with LARP, I'm just like, boom, boom, boom. <laughs> well, and, and you kind of love best what you love first, because, you know, like I, I started with D and D I started with these, and then I spent 10 years doing hero system or champions as some people know it. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. like arguably the mathiest, you know, like, like a beautiful, flawless obelisk of a system that is also a beautiful trap. So if you want, mm -hmm. if you want to make like this, like it's just so good, it's so good, but it is, it is also a trap of a system that is so flexible, you might not realize that you are in a trap. Um, mm -hmm. But so, um, uh, and and also to chime in and and just sort of me too mm -hmm. what you said about D and D, um, mm -hmm. I I sort of lovingly refer to it as as a murder simulator, um, mm -hmm. which it's like boy I don't know how much of that we need these days anymore, um, mm -hmm. and I know uh, who who else was it I was talking with uh, the guy that created Subnautica did you ever play mm -hmm. yeah. I'm familiar. I haven't played, but I am familiar, yeah. And he's like, what if we made a game where the active verb wasn't kill? And I'm like, wild concept, eh? And, mm -hmm. and for people who are my age, it is still a wild concept. And for the people mm -hmm. who didn't come from where we came from, mm -hmm. you aren't overcoming that in the same way because you're playing, you're starting in a different place. And mm -hmm. so I think mm -hmm. that's why it just, it just, wows me so w without further ado here um I, how about this i'll i'll mm -hmm. i'll uh uh do some of like carry some of my weight here um Ooh, so here whoa. we go so i'm so hold on i'm so sorry you're you have a beautiful voice i hope Aww. that's not odd to say no I just, no i just every time you like get close to the mic i'm like whoa okay carry on please <laughs> <laughs> um yeah. uh once upon a time uh, the world was cruel, and there was a witch who knew it well, and so she sold her heart away and built a house in the woods where the world could never find her. At first she would let no one into her fortress, but in the long march of days a strange thing happened. In her own cold and spiteful way the witch made a friend, and then another, and then several more until her house was teeming with colorful faces and complicated lives. The house would come to be known as Yaziba's Bed and Breakfast, and it would last for a very long time. Um, so that's like, that's that's a good hook. Um, and and then the game itself, um, I, have, I have flipped through and I've sort of seen, I haven't had a chance to like g try playing it, but tell me if if the active verb in D and D is kill, like is the what's what's the verb or verbs in in Yazibas? Or what are you trying so, to do here? Mm -hmm. I think um a really important concept to me is that violence in tabletop games is is Violence in a game is not like violence in real life because violence in real life is um, stunning and disorienting and traumatic and gut wrenching. Yeah. It is it 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 shocks you out of where you are. It it is very different, right? Like the idea of swinging a sword and stabbing someone in a like as you as a person is like deeply distressing to even like to kind of grapple with unless you've kind of been through a level of trauma that has really shaped your relationship with what it means to destroy another human being's body. Um, I argue that my games view violence the same way the real world views violence. It does not view violence as a metaphor for self-actualization. It does not view violence as a metaphor for empowerment. It views violence as violence. Um, and so in Sleep Away, that means it's a horror game, right? <laughs> the, the, there's violence in Sleep Away and it is true to violence. Wander Home does not have violence because it is a world that seeks to imagine kind of all the other forms of stories that emerge when we take away the like the crucial violence of the systems we exist in. And Yezeba's is a depiction of the world we exist in, like kind of the, the slice of life and finding excitement in 
all the mundanities and kind of, you know, it understands that perhaps there are these moments of violence, almost especially like, excuse me, almost as like fringe events, right? Like having to sword fight someone is about as likely as getting into a car accident or, <laughs> you know, like uh, going like, you know, like, like going on a huge road trip or like having to spend a year in high school, right? It's this special uh, disorienting event um, that is kind of a major rupture in kind of the, the rest of the day to day. Um, and so I think that the active verbs of Yazeba are kind of like very critically to live life, which I think sounds a little tautological, but I'd argue it's not. I don't think most games and stories are concerned about the act of living life. Um, and I think instead what it's really trying to do is, you know, here is a game where you can go uh, pumpkin picking or do laundry or, you know, like go to the grocery store or, you know, uh, try and keep a Rusalka from destroying the house and breaking out of the mirror or having to go spend a year in high school or, you know, telling stories around a campfire. And all of these activities are similarly positioned, right? Yeah, I, I, uh, you know, gosh, it's, as with many of my conversations about games, it's hard for me not to just start talking about Wanderhome again, because, you know, at one of the parts... At least here it's germane. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, you know, uh, what I what I loved is in the intro that I read um, to, to people here, it's like, this is a world with no violence. And, um, and it's like, and it's not that like, oh we're centering other things in this story or, oh, like there's equal weight given to social mechanics and whatever. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Whereas like, if you look at D and D, uh, one of the maxims uh, in, in teaching is you get what you grade for. And so it doesn't matter what you say you value in the classroom. If you're not assigning a graded weight to attendance, people know that you don't value it. And similarly, mm -hmm. whatever mechanics you have in a game, that is how you are, valuing mm -hmm. what those center around and 85 mm -hmm. percent of D, &D it, it's it's like what sort of damage do you do and how do you do it and how often can you do it and so that means it the 85 percent of the game is about killing things um mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so um and, it, and even in a context where you're like oh this game gives equal weight to social mechanics what you're effectively saying is that oh only 50 percent of right. the things we do are about killing things the other 50 percent encompasses all other human activities yeah <laughs> exactly <laughs> exactly uh, where mm -hmm. you know and and part of me i mean i, I still have uh, pages of notes that i wrote up because as soon wh where i started to come to it is when I was writing my own book and I'm like, you know, cause mm -hmm. fantasy novels, you know, it, a mm -hmm. lot of it starts with the pulps and it starts with Tolkien's and Tolkien mm -hmm. started with the epics and it's all about mm -hmm. war. So if you don't have a goblin army mm -hmm. and a dragon, you're not writing fantasy. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. but I was like, well, but what if, but what if it was just a story about a, a guy who did some stuff and mm -hmm. then people are like, that's not a novel, <laughs> you know? And I'm like, but, 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 but is it, you know? But is it? And, yeah. And so um what uh you know and, and you know at, like do do we need a villain? And the the answer to that is obvious mm -hmm. and Shakespeare answered it cuz Shakespeare mm -hmm. doesn't do a villain with rare exception and his stories mm -hmm. stand the test of time and they're deep and rich mm -hmm. and meaningful mm -hmm. from many angles. The uh um, you know, uh, so, and then the, the sort of the final step there happened when I had kids and, and I think mm -hmm. you'll, you'll dig on this story where you tell stories to your kids or if you're me, you do, um, and tell them the story of the big bad wolf. And it's, it's a great mm -hmm. kid story uh, because there's repetition, there's good special effects, mm -hmm. Um, it's got mm -hmm. three things in it. There's tangibles. It's a good mm -hmm. length. And then my older boy, who at this point, not quite three, says, you know, and when you tell a kid a story, they want to hear it again. And they typically want to hear it the same way again and again because they're learning mm -hmm. the world. Now, yeah. 
I don't want to teach them the same thing again and again, because then I feel mm -hmm. like I'm reassuring them about a solidity that is not going to bear out in their life. And mm -hmm. I want them to learn to be a little more flexible, but, uh, mm -hmm. you know, so I, so I, I tell this story and my, my older boy who at that point was my only boy said, mm -hmm. can you tell the big nice wolf? And, and again, like mm -hmm. here is the, this is his note, you know, mm -hmm. but he, he is still learning how to talk, let alone how to hear and listen uh, to these stories. But what he says, what he is saying is, Hey, baby, your, your draft. I love it. Right. It's good <laughs> stuff. You got mm -hmm. wolves. You got pigs. Love that. You <laughs> love the architecture. I, love the traveling, <laughs> the progression, the straw, mm -hmm. the wood, mm -hmm. the brick. It makes good sense. Mm -hmm. Huffing, puffing. I'm in love do you notice that one of your characters eats another sentient being <laughs> and that me and me and the other producers are like, that's fucking gross. Like somebody killing and eating mm -hmm, another mm -hmm. living sentient creature who speaks and doesn't want this. That's yeah. gross. Like that's bad. And mm -hmm, because okay. again, I've been doing all the, th I was trying to keep him away from violent media. I was trying to mm -hmm. not like make mm -hmm. him all numb and acclimatized to, to so many of these bad things in the world. Mm -hmm. And then he turns around and he's like, can I get a story? But what he was also saying is, Hey, you've been told your whole life as a storyteller that you need conflict and what mm -hmm. I am suggesting to you is that all you need is people interacting and a good repetition and some huffing and puffing. Mm -hmm. I want everything out of that story except the conflict and the violence. Can you do that version for mm -hmm. me? And then I'm like, oh, shit. This is what I shot for in Name of the Wind, where it's like there's no sword fight in the whole movie. There's no car chase. There's nothing blown up. There's no, mm -hmm. you know, I eventually did put a dragon in it kind of to my own chagrin, but, um, mm -hmm. but it's like, that's, you know, and, and a lot of people, when I say, Oh, there's no real plot, there's no real action in there. They're like, yes, there is there's, and I go, there's no fight scene. So they're like, sure there is there's, and what is happening is that they feel emotional engagement and there is conflict mm -hmm. But it's not mm -hmm. violent conflict. It isn't apocalyptic mm -hmm. conflict. Um, mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, seeing this reflected in the world in games that my boys, you know, can play it is so great. Mm -hmm. Now, now, again, because I'm kind of down in my bones a teacher more than I'm anything else, maybe. And so I always mm -hmm. think, yeah, and, and it's sort of an unfortunate truth that regardless of whether or not we are intending to teach anything, people mm -hmm. will learn things from our art, no matter what that art mm -hmm. is. They'll, yeah. they'll, they'll learn things from anything you do, but your art yeah. has a wide audience. Our, yeah, our art is kind of inescapably autobiographical. Yeah. yeah. So what is it that you are hoping to either avoid teaching or mm -hmm. push back against that has previously mm -hmm. been taught or encourage people to think about, and, and let's do it specifically with the new one, mm -hmm. uh, Yabi's, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. uh, and could you say the, the... I So I say Yazeba, Yaziba, or Yazaba. So any of those three, those are mine. You can have your own. Cool. Um, I have a very, I have a very an anarchic perspective when it comes to pronunciation, and no, it always throws people off. Yeah. No, I, I'm the same way. People are like, "How do you pronounce Shaldish? And I'm like, "It depends on where you live in the world. Uh, mm -hmm, it's, mm -hmm. it's, is it the Boston Celtics or is it the Boston Celtics? Bicker all you mm -hmm. want, um, but yeah, mm -hmm. what, what are you shooting for in Yazebas? Um, so I think. My the the writing team in general. I think my my desire. I think is so. There's the thing I talk about with a lot of my work, which is the uh, relationship between the the caring and the melancholy. Hmm. 
um, the the sad and the bright, like the way like basically um, I'm very bored by stories of 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 like trauma without love or stories of like love without some nugget of hurt. Um, and uh, I think that um, with Yazebas, we're hoping to depict a community and the way a community can sh effectively ship a Theseus itself and grow over time as the parts swap out and as the book we've made becomes the book you've made. Um, and because for those who don't know, Yazebas is designed where you play very short chunks of it at a particular time, but you take these little pieces with you and you bring them to the next chapter. And even if someone else plays one of the characters, they're taking these little chunks with them. Um, and what I'm hoping is kind of the, 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 like the process of growing up in a place that cares about you, like kind of very critically, like a, what, you know, like a community that is that like, what care is, is not the denial of any pain, but rather compassion when there is pain and be kind of building a community where you, we can celebrate kind of the quiet little moments and create maybe a sense of what does it mean to tell a story as not being a question of, you know, like what is the core conflict or what is the, like the aggression and what is the like the, the, you know, what is what is the punishment that is meted out? Who are the beings that are killed? But rather instead uh, that we are telling the story of a group of people over a long period of time together collectively. And as we do, we become a group of people over a long period of time, right? That kind of, that that transformation occurs. Um, that, that, that is cool. That, and, and it's interesting to hear you talk about it because a lot of times when I talk about a story, invariably if you have unless it's just a person by themselves it's a story about community and a community mm -hmm. is a sort of family and so it's either a blood family or it's a found family and found family is really interesting mm -hmm. to me but mm -hmm. you know what my when i tell a story i usually think you know how do i reflect that these people love each other and that they mm -hmm. are family, even though it's not in the way that a lot of people would view that. But mm -hmm. what you're doing is telling a story in which the people become a family. And that's, mm -hmm. that's interesting. Um, so I, I, as soon as you said that, you know, where you're like, well, the mechanism mm -hmm. is, I realize I have given short shrift to that. I sort of talked concept and narrative there. But oh come on! The game about... mechanics are just the they're the they're the they're the the grease that gets the wheels going. <laughs> but you know, for I, I'm guessing for anybody who shows up here, um, to sort of know, um, you know, because it's it's a little bit the Wild mm -hmm. West right now. Uh, we're we're seeing. I remember the the Silver Age of RPGs, um, mm -hmm. back when there was no internet and everyone went to Gen Con. And people would print their book and carpool mm -hmm. there and have a booth. And then word mm -hmm. would get around on Saturday that these people aren't going to be able to afford gas home because they sunk mm -hmm. everything into this book. And maybe you should stop by and look at them. Um, mm -hmm. but, uh, but then the price of paper tripled. And the ability to print and sell a reasonably priced book, it went away. And all of these weird indie RPGs kind of shriveled up and died. Like, and this is way back in the 90s. This was like teenagers from outer space. There was a French mm -hmm. one called Trauma. It was, mm -hmm. you know, it was just so hard to even do a silly little throwaway because suddenly the production mm -hmm. costs got so wild and there was no mm -hmm. option other than paper. So, mm -hmm. um, and no way to play except in person. So, uh, you know, in terms of the mechanism... Uh, you know, give us give us just a taste, and then I will say to the chat, uh, I'll let you throw out questions that I will do my mm -hmm. best not to answer because we have a guest, <laughs> and I'm trying to be polite, although um, mm -hmm. I talk too much. So, oh, no, I love hearing you talk. It's really delightful <laughs> to talk to you. Uh, don't worry. Um, I think, uh, yeah, mechanically. Um, so I think within the system of mechanics, Yazeba's Bed and Breakfast is 
um, kind of tricksy. It's part of the, the, the charm of it, where, as I mentioned, these chapters, these kind of modular, hour-long moments where you, a little group of characters tells a story, where it's like, oh, we have to wash, you know, we have to, like, do the laundry or pick pumpkins or, you know, like, go, go mushroom hunting at night. Um, the mechanics radically change for each chapter to suit the kind of emotional state and tone of the activity you're getting up to, whether or not it's frantic or creepy or, you know, reflective or peaceful. Um, and so when the mechanics change dramatically, the thing that ties them together is like the process of unlocking new chapters and growing the book over time. But um, it's a game where uh, yeah, the mechanics change every time, uh, basically. Uh, but if you've played Wander Home, Wander Home is a very simple mechanical system, which some people have said, which I always, someone once described it as being more like percussion than a traditional mechanical system, where normally in a game, the mechanics are kind of this very overarching process, whereas in Wander Home, the mechanics are about providing a steady backbeat um, and not kind of being present. Um, and in Wander Home, there's a very simple token economy, which is why I like the percussion metaphor, because it feels like when you're playing in person, there's this tapping of the tokens on the table. Um, and Yuzeba's has a little bit of that, but it's got a few other things too. And it's got, you know, we, we borrow a little from all over the place. We borrow from Tic-Tac-Toe and uh, Hex Crawls and League of Legends and all sorts of whatever else we can find lying around, whatever spare mechanics, we dust them off, we plug it in and we stick it out the side. Um, <laughs> um that's the that's the mechanics side i'm i i confess i i feel like mechanics are the mechanics are the the they're almost they're they're yeah they're weird <laughs> it's it's the it's the sort of the the the, the messy necessary but how about this let me mm -hmm. rephrase it instead of mm -hmm. mechanics um the mm -hmm. overall structure you mentioned mm -hmm. because like sleep away obviously you know you could do that you know like you know for D and D. Mm -hmm. You have a session mm -hmm. and then you have a campaign or and in that mm -hmm. you might have mm -hmm. an adventure um, mm -hmm. for Wander Home. It is deliberately built in a modular way so that you mm -hmm. can retire a character because they have reached a place where they want to stay. And so they're not going to be wandering with the group anymore. And so I like mm -hmm. the ship of Theseus there, which is you could have a group of people who constantly play and as a result, like maybe they play 12 times and at the end of that, nobody is playing the same characters, but it's still the same mm -hmm. game. Um, mm -hmm. Or you could still, you could all play the same characters for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, for, for this one, um, you mentioned the book. You know, you're sort of building the, the book and you mentioned legacy. And uh, so do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so the way you say was Ben Breakfast divides is, as I mentioned, these hour long chapters um, where you play a chapter and it has these preset characters. And the reason we use preset characters is so that it makes it much easier to tell the story because the fiction, can, we can write prose, right? We have the wonderful L.D. Lewis editing the all the prose, by the way, which I'm so excited for. Um, and we get to edit the prose and each chapter gets to be its own uh, kind of mechanical narrative thing with very specific decisions made about it. And then let's say, for example, I play Parrish, the frog chef of the bed and breakfast. And while I'm playing this chapter with Parrish, I find a nice little hat and I draw a little picture of the hat on his character sheet. Now, next time, if you're the one playing Parrish, the next chapter we play, you can take that and there'll be that little hat on there. And maybe Parrish's journey will have grown and maybe he'll be up to some other things. And so as we play the game, as we play these hour long chunks, maybe it's the same group of people meeting every single day. Maybe we get really attached to specific characters. Maybe we like swapping around and trying out different folks. Um, maybe I run a lot of one shots with a lot of random people. And so the game kind of builds up this ephemera from all these different folks I play with. But no matter what, it's very, you know, like whoever shows up each week, maybe. I used to run mega dungeons. And so there's, we joke a little bit that it's like a narrative mega dungeon because it's just whoever shows up each week can play. Um, and that's, I think that's the structure of it. It's this little, it's a little, it's a short game over and over. And then it, it changes to the legacy mechanics as you go. Yeah. 
and I've I, I'm new to legacy games, which is weird because D and D of its nature, you know, is mm -hmm. is a game where the world mm -hmm. and your characters mm -hmm. change. But um, you know, now I am playing. It's very different when it's it's you're changing your paladin versus you're handing your paladin off to someone else, right? And seeing what they get back. To which you. which is a concept that's so it's going to be so unfamiliar because like even in Wanderhome, you have a character, but it's yours, and then you might decide to lay them down, but nobody else picks that back up. But of course, mm -hmm. if you're if you're doing just storytelling, and 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 again, my experience with D and D, even though I didn't realize it at the time, is that we were constantly breaking the rules to tell the stories we wanted to tell. And there were mm -hmm. three of us in high school, good friends, my friend Steve and Ryan, and we played constantly. But two players and a DM, it's a very small mm -hmm. group. And none of us wanted to DM mm -hmm. all the time because that sucks. So we would actually, mm -hmm. we, we figured out a way to rotate that. And every mm -hmm. player had a folder that the other two mm -hmm. people could read and put things in the folder, but the player couldn't. Oh. And so you could maintain mm -hmm. like mystery about their character or you find an item, but you don't know about mm -hmm. it, but the other players mm -hmm. slash game runners it was our mm -hmm. attempt to construct a a dm list system while still having mm -hmm. sort of narrative like guidance mm -hmm. and uh so it's seeing these done and effectively but like if you think about all the long-term actual plays with all these brilliant improv people like mm -hmm. um not so much over at critical role but um, you'll see it in, uh, come on, it, uh, with the McElroys. They, yes. they play yeah. a game and one of them sort mm -hmm. of makes up a character in the background. Mm -hmm. And then, oh no, now mm -hmm. this character has a funny voice and a name. Mm -hmm. And they're, oh no, somebody's like, and, and mm -hmm. that character kind of gets passed around a little bit as they become mm -hmm. part of the world. So uh, seeing mm -hmm. a system that actively supports this uh, mm -hmm. is, is super neat for me. I like to say that I, I, I'm very interested in, I'm much more than I'm interested in Dungeons and Dragons. I'm interested in the way people play Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> I'm, right. much more a, I'm much more of a student of the of the games people play at the table than I am of the book and the text. Cause the book and the text is kind of a horrible thing to read. Um, but the way people play is a lot of fun. So clearly I want to, I want to learn more from the way people play. Yeah. Um, and I, I think you've given a really good example of like a lot of the tricks I learned from Wanderhome, I learned from hanging out with people while they play fifth edition D and D and being like, Oh, that's a safety tool. You're just doing, you're just, you know, you've invented this thing you're doing, you're just doing it. Um, and yeah, I could write that down in a book. Why not? I <laughs> right. Uh, here's a question from the chat. Uh, what was the play test mm -hmm. experience like when you were creating this? Um, so playtesting as Ava's Bed and Breakfast was great because I have um, fibromyalgia and some other stuff as well, which means that uh, playing a game for three or four hours at a time becomes like harder and harder to fit into my life. Um, considering I have to, you know, block out chunks of time for napping. <laughs> um, and so uh, having a game that was an hour, it was, it was, it was when we realized that the characters were the most exciting part it was almost like when the play test like suddenly clicked and it was like we played a little hour of it and we were like oh that was fun and then we played another chapter and then we were like oh wait hold on this is there's something here about watching the way this person has changed their character and what they've learned from the way they've been talking to each other and then i did we started writing the game in november of 2019 so it's older than the pandemic wow. um and uh it's seen a lot of play tests and having a physical play test binder and doing all this online stuff and seeing just kind of the process of as a fan base, kind of a nascent fan base starts to grow. And these things about characters, which aren't anywhere in the book, but kind of become a popular joke among people that they incorporate. And I think there was a moment recently when a, when a Canadian player told me that um, the Quebecois players keep making uh, Parish the frog 
Parisian and making him French. Oh, uh, because he's just to them, he's a knight. But the the French, the Francophone tradition of knights is much more like all oh, mainland France than it is here where we're drawing on like Arthurian or Shakespearean stuff. Yeah. So the character is like, I was like, oh wait, the character changes across the culture language barrier. And then I was like, oh, I, oh there's, just, there's just a lot of little things. Yeah, I think playtesting has been a continuous surprise, um, but I think that was a couple of more, a couple of fun moments from it. Yeah, uh, we have another person here. Oh, and we are we are a little past two. I can stay a little late. I don't want to. I'm oh. fine staying late. I don't I don't want to hold you. I'm good. I this is my job. So after this, I'm just gonna go answer emails until uh, the sun. Boy, and, or burns out in my case. Yeah, I, I hear that. <laughs> um, yeah, in this during this call, I've gotten eleven emails. <laughs> oh, no. I started this call with an empty inbox. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> um, but no, I, I've 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 time to take. I, you're the one with the schedule. Cool. So. No, I I did not back anything up against the the end of this. Mm -hmm. So, um, it says, uh, have you taken any inspiration from Eastern game designs such as Golden Sky Stories and, oh boy, I don't know how to Ryutama. pronounce that. Is that India? Ryutama. Don't worry. No, Ryutama and Golden Sky Stories are both Japanese. Okay. They came out, I think. Eight or nine years ago, and they were, I think, uh, I think they came out like 10 years ago and were translated like five years ago. Um, they're both wonderful games. Um, the, the Japanese tradition of tabletop role playing game design is very interesting, it's very different from the narrative style games you see here. Um, in a big way, there's a lot of using mechanics in order to simulate worlds. Um, and using a lot of kind of mechanics to build these peaceful stories. So uh, Ryutama, I, Ryutama is a poor example. I don't really think it's a peaceful game. Um, it's not peaceful for me when I play it. Golden Sky Stories uh, is a game that is where he plays these little animal people who are helping out in a village, like these little animal gods who are like going around like helping solve problems. Um, and it's a very crunchy, very mechanical game. So I certainly looked at it to see like, you know what is it what is its perspective on slice of lifeness what is its perspective on non-violent storytelling but it's a very different tradition than what i do um it's just also oftentimes most gamers main exposure to non-violent games because it's coming from a tradition where that's not weird <laughs> like right. in america of violence is so normalized that when we translate these games from japan that aren't violent people get really thrown off by it and like you know, I think I think I'm I'm much more I'm coming from a different background and a different style, but I've certainly you know read them and I'm familiar. Yeah. Um, somebody also in the chat here has said the safety tools section of Yazubas is the best part of the ash can. Um, what, while I'm trying to flip to it, uh, can you explain mm -hmm. what an ash can is? That's a term that I've only learned recently. Yeah. Uh, an ash can is just, it comes from comics where it's like the cheapest version of the comic you can print because it'll just be thrown out in the ash can. Um, and it's just the, it's the version of Yoseba's bed and breakfast but put into the world. It's like no art, no layout, just a, a Google doc that's been converted into a PDF. And it's, you know, it is just what it is, um, which is nice to have out in the world, even if part of me is always like, oh, it's not, it's not what the game will look like, but you know, it's a it's a good it's a good document to have to kind of print out and throw around and have access to. And and the safety I'm still looking for I don't know if it's in my copy here mm -hmm. the safety section. But mm -hmm. do you want to talk a little bit about mm -hmm. your safety mechanics? Which again, yeah. not something I grew up mm -hmm. with, but absolutely something mm -hmm. I talk mm -hmm. about every time I play now. Yep, yep, yeah. Um, so. I have a lot of complicated feelings on safety mechanics. I think basically like any marginalized game designer who's been like having to kind of navigate the world of safety mechanics and really think about them has a lot of complex feelings. Um, and um, oftentimes for me, I think that the traditional approaches of safety within a text don't go far enough. I've actually, I one time was put on a Twitter block list for being critical of the X card when my criticism was that I felt that it was inadequate and didn't go nearly far enough as I wanted it to, ah. which was an interesting little Twitter moment of, of many. Um, <laughs> but um, I do think in general, uh, safety in games is something that needs to be coded in kind of at every level. And so when I write my games, I try to create 
um, the mechanics of safety, of belonging, of inclusion, of uh, um, of agency, kind of built into every single part of it. Um, like. I think when people talk about wander home and safety, they oftentimes talk about the journeying tools and they miss that that is one safety mechanic of about four or five throughout the book. Um, it's just the one that looks the most like a safety mechanic we might be familiar with. Um, in Yuseba's Bed and Breakfast, the safety section is um, written by Hey Kid, who is the, the resident 10 year old in a, like hyperactive ADHD child who, uh, has written this whole section being like, listen, rules are like bedtimes and calendars, <laughs> ignore them. <laughs> um, or being like, you know, being like, I know I talk a lot. You know, if you talk a lot too, you should make sure that your friends who aren't talking are happy not talking. You should make sure that everyone's, you know, like this kind of this, or like, you know, like boys and girls both have cooties, but they have different kind of cooties. <laughs> <laughs> You know, like this, like just like these little, these little bits of, you know, like if something creeps me out, you know, like it gives me the cooties, don't, you know, that kind of, um, these kind of like advice moments, um, which was, I wrote it that way because I was in charge of writing the safety section and I was struggling for days to write it as I couldn't find kind of the right narrative voice that communicated it with the, the levity, but also care that I wanted. And so I sat there kind of writing out this thing and deleting it and writing it and deleting it. And then finally I was just like, what if like, I just want this, like the, the safety at its core is just like, you know, play the way kids play. And like, don't be afraid to be a little rough house, but also be ready to stop and put some band-aids on, right? Like, yeah, you know, like that's the, that's the crux of play. It's like, you know, be, be compassionate with each other play a little wild, be aware of your body and like, make sure you take care of yourself and you don't, you know, go further than you want to. Man, it's, that's well said the, you know, and I think about my boys because I started telling them stories and then, you know, as soon as they could talk, the story started becoming collaborative, um, mm -hmm. which I was still telling the story, but they were adding to it. And then I was telling a story, but they were in it. And then mm -hmm. slowly we were telling it together. Um, and mm -hmm. it, uh, probably the biggest regret of my life is mm -hmm. I, I wanted to start recording the stories I was telling with my older boy when he was around four, five, six. Because the mm -hmm. way he approached all of these things, he, was, he, he hadn't been sort of polluted by the world. And so like I was moving him through this world and he was playing a young boy who was going out on adventures. Mm -hmm. And so of necessity, mm -hmm. like there might be danger, but they're like, he wasn't going to fight mm -hmm. an ogre because he's a kid, mm -hmm. you know, but mm -hmm. also at one point he finds, and, and this, I'll, I'll restrict myself to just this one cute kid story, mm -hmm. but you know, one of the, the problems to solve I put in there is he, he there was a, 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 a big, you know, crack in, in the ground and there was somebody down there and, and he, uh, and, and it started off kind of Jack and the Beanstalk. There's a young boy and, uh, and he lived with his mama and they were very poor. And so one day he decided to go out and have some adventures and see if he could find some treasure to bring it back. It's a little capitalist, right? But you know, mm -hmm. it's an easy of course, hook. Of course. Uh, mm -hmm. but, mm -hmm. uh, and then, so, uh, you know, the, the first time he came back, you know, it's like, and they mostly mm -hmm. ate apples because they had an apple tree. The first time he mm -hmm. came back, he had found like three gold coins. I say, well, what do you spend the coins on? Mm -hmm. And he goes, well, we would buy a cow so that we have milk. And mm -hmm. I'm like, good choice. And then he's like, and he's like, I should, it's like, can I buy my mom a, a nice dress? And he's like, yeah. And then he's like, could I? Can I buy a toy? You know? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, bunny. That's a great choice. Like you've got mm -hmm. this stuff and you've already spent most of it on the family. You can buy something like way to, way to think of yourself. You wish I could, mm -hmm. you know, uh, good job. Mm -hmm. uh, but then he went out mm -hmm. into the world in one of the later adventures and there's this crack in the ground. And he hears help, help. So he goes down and he finds there's this stream and there's this, this old man mm -hmm. and 
because his favorite magic item, which that's hard too, mm-hmm. coming up with magic items that aren't weapons. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, yeah. But yeah. His, his favorite one is a rope that ties and unties itself because mm-hmm. like, what a great magic item. And he would use it to solve all these problems. Mm-hmm. So he went down and he, and the, the old man's like, thank you so much for saving me. Um, he goes, here, take, take this. And it was a, a, a couple of sheets of paper. And if he, whatever he painted on them would become real. And I'm like, he'll use these to solve this other puzzle. There's a door uh-huh, he can't uh-huh. get through. And then, and then he's like, okay, we go home. And I'm like, what do you mean? I'm like, are, are you bored? Are you, did you get scared in this? Do are you do you mm-hmm. want to do something else? He goes, well, no, we go home. I go, what do you mean we go home? He goes, this man doesn't have a home. He's been down here for so long. He's he comes back to live with us because we have milk and apples, and he needs a place to live. Right? And I'm gonna cry, even though I've told this story a hundred times. Because, again, unpoisoned by the world, he has not played these other games. He does not know that the old man you meet in the cave is just going to give you some shit so you can solve a different puzzle. This is a person. And he doesn't have a home. And he's been alone for a long time. And so, of course, he comes back with me. And and, and I'm like, how, how can I ever live up to this? How can I ever protect you in the way that you need to be protected so that you always think like this you know Mm -hmm. um but watching yeah but then he then unbeknownst to me started doing something he calls mms um Mm -hmm. but they're just these story games except he tells them to his friends and he tells Mm -hmm. them to his brother and they're Mm -hmm. constant collaborative storytelling um and uh but but it's it's wild to see what arises naturally if you don't start with murder (laughs) yeah yeah well the thing that i i love oh that's so i'm i just i'm like um the thing that i kind of always think about is that the the human capacity for like art and articulation is like the world is full of infinite things to do and I think that we we almost we almost crowd it out with with violence. That violence is a very noisy thing, and it drowns out the sounds of all the quiet littler things we can be doing. And with Wander Home, I almost feel I often feel like Wander Home like could have violence in it. I guess like if I guess it, it, like if there's a world where it does, but it was almost like. It wasn't so much that like oh I'm trying to you know I'm, I'm the, you know this is the this is like my big manifest on why it is always wrong to tell stories about hurting people which is not really something I I believe but it was important to be like let's make a space where like we don't invite violence to the party yeah. right like <laughs> right. violence is a violence is a noisy house house guest and we invite violence to every single party and they trash the bathroom <laughs> and they they make all the other guests not want to show up so maybe we can throw a party that's not just us hanging out with violence yeah um and i think like oh that that's very really so sweet i love finding homes <laughs> wow who would have thought um well that was the I game that, that i really love that i've wanted to make for a decade which is a version mm-hmm. Because, like, for me, it's easy. I tell stories. I can't not tell stories. And so doing this with my Mm -hmm. boys is easy. But I'm like, a lot of parents probably, they're tired, you know, or they just not, Mm -hmm. they're not native uh, narrative. They're they're not narrativores. They don't live and Mm -hmm. eat Mm -hmm. and excrete story. Um, But I always thought, like, what if I could give them a framework within which you can like do these little brief kind of fairy tale esque stories with your kids where you don't have to come up with everything off the cuff because you've got like some, just some tokens and the, the kid Mm -hmm. it's, and in some ways it would be sort of like RPG training wheels because they're like, Mm -hmm. I have a backpack and it has five spaces 
And I, what do I take with me? I take apples. I take my magic rope. Mm -hmm. I take a flashlight. And a, mm -hmm. a cool thing you find is like a potion. It's like, cool, I put it in mm -hmm. my backpack. And then you're looking mm -hmm. at it. So if you're like, because what you realize when you're running a, a story mm -hmm. slash game for a three-year-old mm -hmm. is that you know that they have a candle, but they have forgotten. And that sucks because you designed this puzzle to be solved by mm -hmm. a candle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um so yeah, I I I am loving mm -hmm. these seeing these games come into the world mm -hmm. and and not feeling like I have to make them or they won't exist. Yeah, yeah. I've been um, having a lot of fun sketching out um, magic. I I want to do an expansion for Wander Home, of course, right? Because how can you not? Um, and I have like this these sketches of magic spells, and it's been very fun making all these spells, which like are like it's like our framework for fantasy magic is also in violence. And when we talk about what is magic in a fantasy context, it is oftentimes connected to the imposing of willpower over another being. Mm, it, is yeah. a, it is a, there is kind of this element that's very kind of hostile and unwanted, uh, even in spells that aren't necessarily quote unquote violent, like, you know, like transfiguration or, you know, like changing the landscape. Um, and uh one of my favorite spells is the series of spells that are peaches, which are where you have a you have a bunch of peaches in your bag and you can pull them out and they have different properties. Um, and one of my favorite properties, if, if it's okay for me yeah. to read, read no, please, the, the please. paragraph really quick, let me just, let me find it really fast. Um, da, 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 da. Um, thankfully I have my, I have everything organized pretty well. Uh, somehow, despite everything. Um, so the spell, which is, you know, uh, spend a token and procure a ripe peach from your bag. It is a softer taste than your other peaches with a tougher skin and a smaller form. This is a peach of good fortune and the pit inside is golden. If one plants the pit in their garden, they are sure to have an abundant harvest next fire top, which is autumn. And if one mixes it into their herd's provender, their herd will have good health and beautiful honey. Most remarkably of all, if a couple struggling to have a child sleeps with the pit underneath their pillow, in nine months, a massive peach will appear and a child with golden eyes will emerge from the fruit's flesh. Oh. The spell may only be cast once a, once a month. Oh, that's, um, some, that's good. <laughs> that's good folktale shit right there, folks. <laughs> right, right. Like, and also it's like, okay, well, first off, that's like a very classic folktale concept, but also it's like, I've just never engaged with fantasy media that has a spell that's just like, you can help this family out if they're struggling. And it's like, when we talked about earlier how violent, you know, like you are graded based on what you are given, right? Like when you give people only tools for violence, it's like, well, how well does your violence stack up? But I, to me, I personally feel like my relationship with the game changes very dramatically when the game looks at me and is like, Here's a peach with which can help a couple deal with like a, a couple trouble they're having, or like help a herd have better honey, right? Like, because you're not, or like, you know, like better, better for whatever. And like, you're not thinking about like that's not your natural instinct. And I oftentimes, the, the thing that I do to explain games is that games are not the like a game text is not responsible for creating play, right? Like the thing you described with your son, that is a very pure instance of play that couldn't really be like a game text couldn't be like just do this <laughs> go go forth um but a game text exists to create those little moments of complication when it's feeling hard to find it um and to me that's kind of like the magic of what a game what a game book gets to be is that you know ideally a game book should be something that is enjoyable to read but then also provides um these these complicating moments that allow you to just have like, just like almost like the moment you described with your son where it's like your son has this different relationship with this guy and it complicates the game. The game text should be able to kind of have those complications, but not to have it be an intrusion, you know? Yeah, yeah. And in a perfect world, and what I'm learning about more and more as I turn my hand to various types of game design um is well and as i i've played games my whole life and that's the one upside of of being old is that you've had longer to do these things um but when you see the the ways that things are done and the, the effects they have and you know that in the same way that everyone who reads a novel reads it their own way 
and everyone mm-hmm. will ignore things or skim things or or disagree with things or sometimes just either willingly or unwillingly misread the text and that is their experience you know or willfully or mm-hmm. or or accidentally mm-hmm. misread the text mm-hmm. um and similarly when you play a game what's so informative is how people break the game to get it to do what they want mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. for me it's when when i think about game design i i wander between wanting to do really really loose framework that gives you the tools to do whatever you want or um to um give you mechanisms to like that will support certain behaviors that you want to encourage that are vital to the experience you're trying to provide in the game, which for me is always about Mm -hmm. story. Like what sort of story are we going to tell? And if it's a murder story, do a murder mechanic. And if it's, you know, about family, then you better have something to support the, the, Mm -hmm. those Mm -hmm. or, or it won't feel tangible. Um, But yeah, the, the difference between leaving space for happy accident Mm -hmm. and, almost like digging a groove well and then there's Mm -hmm. the rails which everyone kind of acknowledges Mm -hmm. that rails not the best Mm -hmm. but then i always think of it more as like i'm gonna sort of dig a little gully here so when the rain comes Mm -hmm. it's real likely to go down here um Mm -hmm. yeah Mm -hmm. i oftentimes think about it as oftentimes mechanics are either about as you said the gully they're either they're either the like you know, if you imagine you're creating like a water formation, you want some streams that are very clear and you want some dams to slow things down. Right. And oftentimes, and oftentimes the trick and the beauty of it is that um, like, I oftentimes like to joke that the purpose of a rule, like rules are like no trespassing signs. A no trespassing sign is an invitation to trespass. <laughs> almost, yeah. It is. It introduces the almost concept in sense, of trespassing. Exactly. It demands. And so to me, the rules of a game are the invitation to either do you wish to follow this path I've created or do you want to break my rule? Right. right. Before there was no question about either, but now you have an interesting choice. Yeah. And so they get to kind of be these these fun little gifts that the the act of rejection is very thrilling. Well, and and like transgression is so important. Failure is so important for learning. And as a parent, you know, I think a lot like you do not want to be that, you know, you don't want to be that that rigid authoritarian who stifles your child. However, I think a lot of progressives are like, no restrictions, do whatever you want. And I'm like, no, actually, no, like you can do a lot of things, but then also Mm -hmm. these things. And what I'm giving my children is a gift Mm -hmm. by, by being a little bit authoritarian Mm -hmm. because they will not have to struggle to rebel against me. Um, Whereas Mm -hmm. if you have no rules, then in order to rebel, Mm -hmm. they need to like, you know, become a violent person. Marxist mm-hmm. anarchist uh, you know and like hijack a yeah. space shuttle where I'm like no mm-hmm. my kids will be able to rebel more easily than that and learn mm-hmm. learn the joy of that and learn the consequences of rebellion and rule breaking I've even mm-hmm. told them one of them in a quiet kind of said you know sometimes I kind of want to be naughty and he, he got teary and mm-hmm. I'm like oh, oh sweetie it's okay you know who likes to, you know who else likes to be naughty and i'm like i'm i'm pretty good at it too i've done it my whole life if you ever want to be naughty tell me and we'll figure out a fun way to do it together that's also safe you know and mm-hmm. they won't always do it with me but i want mm-hmm. them to know that like hey we're going to do this together and you can break mm-hmm. these rules 
And for you, I've made a few extra rules that it's not such a big deal mm -hmm. if you break them. I, I have a I have a little thought and a big thought. Um, the little thought that I think you'd appreciate is um, there's a game I published last year for fun, which is a very crunchy fourth edition style Norse combat game that is presented through the lens of these two girls in a Celtic monastery inventing a game together. Oh. And then it's like, oh, they've made this crunchy fourth edition combat game. And in it, there's a moment when it's talking about movement pace on the grid map. And one of the girls turns to the other and is like, hey, um, how do how should we handle diagonals? And then the other girl says, oh, we'll deal with it later. And then they move on and it's never addressed. And so that is the idea of that in the text. The purpose is to immediately say, in order to play this game, you have to make choices about yeah. the structure of the game on a fundamental level. And that is like, you've got to figure it out because I'm not gonna like, forcing you to, to disagree with the text, right? Because any stance you take is gonna be a different interpretation and immediately yeah. putting the player in that spot where it's like, you gotta rebel against me a little bit if you wanna keep playing. Yeah. Um, and the, the other thing that I think is a bigger thought perhaps is um, I like to use the metaphor of the playground. Um, and I find a playground to be a really helpful metaphor because I, what I want from my games is a mix of spaces where I can run around and a mix of spaces that I can climb on. <laughs> because when I, if I present you with monkey bars or like a, let's say like a slide, for example, a slide yeah. has a very <laughs> clear and communicated purpose. You are supposed to, right? I know exactly where you're going with this. You know yep. exactly where yep. I'm going with this. You get it, yeah. <laughs> a slide has a clear and open purpose, which is to go down it. But it also demands a second response, which is to climb up it. <laughs> Uh, right? Um, and similarly, monkey bars do not have a clear purpose, but they create this complication when you're playing tag, for example, you're playing tag and playing tag with monkey bars is a very different game. Um, and maybe there's a section of the playground that's just a wide open field and there's nothing going on there. You can just run around and do whatever you want, but you can also come back over to this complicated part um, and like fiddle with the fiddle with the bits um, and create kind of new games. Maybe there's like you know, tic-tac-toe stuck in the wall, right? Like some fancy playgrounds have that. Um, but maybe you don't use that for tic-tac-toe, maybe use it for secret messages, right? So the game um, structurally demands you do all sorts of things with it. It really, it's it, to me, a game is not, it's not, like a game text is not tag. I'm, it's not tic-tac-toe, right? It's not, I'm not gonna teach you how to play tag. I'm gonna give you a playground and say, Tag's a fun game, if you ever tried. <laughs> right, you know, and I love, I, I I feel like if I have the right sort of conversations in the next week, I think a slide mechanic in games might become shorthand for me, which is, um, uh, you know, this is, this is something put in a game that is mm -hmm. a ton of fun if you do it in the right way, but mm -hmm. it's also put in there knowing that people will try to climb up it, which seems contrary, but is for a certain. And I, I want to say, hey, chat, just if you can say, I'd like to know, uh, you can either type in, I, I don't want to take the time for a poll, but type in either I climbed it or I never thought of it. I just want to see, I, I like <laughs> climbed it. You know, it's like, you know. Or you could even say, like, because there's three types of people. There's only down. There's there's sometimes I climb it too, and there's only uppers. You know, I will say only uppers and only downers have more in common than the people who want to do mm -hmm, both. Mm -hmm. um, I I was a kid. I would rarely climb up, but there was this slide at my playground that had two little metal bolts at the bottom. And so if you slid down the slide and then before putting your feet on the ground, you could touch the bolts and get a static shock oh. um, and probably give yourself a little brain, bit of brain, brain damage or something. <laughs> um, <laughs> but my, me and my friends would do that, which was, I think it's a form of going down the slide, but with an added little twist, because it becomes like this kind of risk where it's like, you don't want to shock yourself too badly, but also, you know, oh, it was it raining yesterday. It becomes kind of, I think a, a risk taking game. Yeah, um, so we're at half past here. You brought up the playground, yes. And I, I love this is a this is a different paradigm than I normally mm -hmm. think in. Oh, and I hate the fact that I kind of unironically use the term paradigm, 
Um, <laughs> I do it too, don't worry. <laughs> um, I'm the worst mix of an intellectual because I never got a degree in anything. So I just make things up and read books. Yeah, I mean, um, it's the, I, I, I will I will go with a, uh, with an enthusiast over an academic any day. Um, uh, mm -hmm. But I, I was thinking, you're right. Like a playground that is just a field, there's only so much you can do. But a playground mm -hmm. that is an obstacle course, there's only so much you can do. Um, like giving people fun things to play with, you know, and then you could get into the whole difference between what is the difference between a game and a toy. Um, and, but, but we shouldn't because we've already talked for a while, um, <laughs> but mm -hmm. you mentioned the playground and pff, the slide is so good. I remember going mm -hmm. and watching my kids at the park mm -hmm. and, quite aside from like my personal struggles there where I'm like, how much do I dad my kids in public or how much do I dad everyone? And it turns out my eventual answer is a lot. I, you know, I will, <laughs> I will dad at the drop of a hat, mm -hmm. apparently uh, <laughs> to the point where during one fourth of July, when there's like 150 kids in this thing where I'm, mm -hmm. I am instituting the rule of law in this playground and a kid is like a little teenager, almost teenager is like, are you the police? And I said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hey. Uh, hey, uh, Wormwood Gaming. Uh, do you know Wormwood? Have, like they make the beautiful I... game tables. Oh, yes, I am. I have seen the, their handiwork. I've never had the pleasure to meet them. But hello, Wormwood Gaming. Nice to meet you. Thanks so much for, for raiding in, Wormwood. Uh, and, and what a great stream to raid in on where we're talking about games that can be played with Wormwood equipment. Uh, Worm, <laughs> Wormwood a also... Quick, a quick ad break, if you would. <laughs> Wormwood also supports world builders uh, in, in really kind and generous ways. Um, mm -hmm. so, so I'll say this. Uh, I went, I, I'm at the park and my kids are playing. And when you put kids together, I mean, the reason they call plays plays is because it's a form of play, you know, and it used to mm -hmm. be more interactive than is polite now. Mm -hmm. But, mm -hmm. you know, you have the equipment and, and, of, and I knew that games were going to emerge, you know, and mm -hmm. the rules will be partly uh, explicit and partly mm -hmm. implicit. But mm -hmm. for me, the most interesting rules are the implicit rules. And what the, the game that emerged, of course, and it happens all the time, is if they have one of those like plank bridges that are on chains, they kind of mm -hmm. bounce, mm -hmm. or a tire bridge or whatever. And what happens is there's kids on the ground, there are kids up there, and the game mm -hmm. is just, can I touch you? You know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, which sounds creepier than it is. Let's not make this no, weird, I, everyone. I know, I know how kids work. I know how kids game work. And so, yeah. like, if you run across the bridge, people will try to reach up and touch you. And if you're a big kid, you want to be on the ground because you can reach up and it's a little more active. And if you're a little kid, you can you can still mm -hmm. run. So there's a space for everyone to play. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. But it, and nobody says, okay, if we're down here, we're touchers. If we're up there. You're the you're the in threat of touch, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but what I realized is, and and this is also a literal and as well as a figurative game changer in the way I thought mm -hmm. about games, is mm -hmm. the purpose of that game was absolutely not to win, mm -hmm. because to win the game, all you have to do is go up here on this tallest thing and no kid is tall enough to touch you. And so mm -hmm. if the only purpose, if, if there were points and you got points for every minute of not mm -hmm. getting touched, you would get mm -hmm. max points, perfect mm -hmm. score, A plus, but that's mm -hmm. not the point. The point is to be as daring as possible and get mm -hmm. not touched or maybe mm -hmm. slightly mm -hmm. too daring and get touched because Losing a little bit is best play. And let me say that again. And could somebody please write this down for me? Losing mm -hmm. a little bit is best play. Uh, mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. otherwise you end up with a brain like mine where you feel like you need 
to get 100% completion and you will mm-hmm. never be okay again. And mm-hmm. so a game where you can't play perfectly probably would teach a, a beautiful mm-hmm. version of this mm-hmm. lesson. My, my kids have learned mm-hmm. it better than I have where I, I sometimes I point out to my younger, I'm like, you know, you're picking a lot of birds here and they all lay eggs, but none of your, none of your birds produce food. And he's like, mm-hmm. I like these birds. Um, you know, and I want, I want these birds. And I'm like, you know what? He goes, he goes, it makes me happy. And this is the way I want to play. And I'm like, Oh, sorry. Mm-hmm. You're right. <laughs> and then also he wins a lot too. So I'm like, dang, I, you know, you're, you're mm-hmm, better at mm-hmm. this in both ways. Mm-hmm. Okay. I think um, something there's there's a little bit of a debate in in the LARP world. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm, goodness, I'm, I feel like I'm no um, no. There's a little bit of a debate in the LARP world between um, there's kind of two broad. This this is a simplification. All binaries are, but this one is uh, that there's the 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 crowd of people who want to play to win, right? The idea of competition, the idea of mastery, and the appeal of system mastery. The idea that you have taken control of this and you have mastered and you win, and the the folks who play to lose, which is a, a mainly Scandinavian approach to LARP, which is about uh, kind of intentionally leading your character into disaster yeah. and the idea of like aiming for failure. Um, and an interesting thing that I, I have learned is that I think that both are kind of valuable tools and that um, one of my favorite kind of relationships to play I encounter is um, a lot of children's games um, or, you know, like for example, um, like team-based games, right? Like oftentimes, like for example, Capture the Flag um, will exist in a space where you are trying your hardest to win, but you don't care if you win. <laughs> right. Which is kind of a very optimal spot. I, we, I oftentimes call it like competitive collaboration, where Ooh. it is you are trying, you are, the game is most fun when everyone, I, I think I used to play a lot of Among Us, but when that was like a very big thing. And so I have like, a lot of opinions on like what makes a good game of Among Us. Um, but that is also a game where it is fun when a lot of people are trying to win, but there is no kind of pain when you lose, right? Like the fun is the is the trying, like, and this idea of like striving within the confines of the game, but also knowing that kind of there is a lot of joy in losing the game as well. And that is so well said. And it's something that occurs in many places and in all sorts of games where, you know, it's sort of like, if you like playing poker, but you don't like playing for money, it's hard for mm-hmm. people like because if if even if you're playing like nickel ante poker, mm-hmm. you're still playing for money, and then people still want to win. But again, it's not mm-hmm. like at the end of the night anyone's like, "Oh God, mm-hmm. I'm going to have to mm-hmm. take a second job." In- yeah. <laughs> instead, so you get mm-hmm. the engagement, but there's there's no. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, there's no huge negative yeah. attachment. And I will mm-hmm. argue, because sometimes people mm-hmm. say, oh, I don't care if I win. And then I'm mm-hmm. like, oh, I don't want to play with you. If this is a game yeah. with a point structure mm-hmm. saying, oh, I don't care if I win. I'm like, oh, mm-hmm. that person. I mean, the person who is only going to win mm-hmm. will ruin the game too. But yeah. somebody who doesn't care about the results of the game yeah will really wreck a dynamic as well in a in a in a different way yeah i i often um say that i try to play games to the best that the game of the like i try to play games to what that game calls of me and for competitive games people are oftentimes shocked because they're used to me being like oh the non-violent story game girl, <laughs> you know and then i I roll up and I like kick their I kick their butts at some <laughs> video game and they're like why you know why and like I'm just, I'm trying to I'm playing the game to what it demands of me and I like narrative games because they don't demand that I try and win but um, I think you'll appreciate this dad story yeah, if yeah. I can for a moment because I've got a story about my dad who uh, Rick Dragon he's a really lovely guy just wanted to Dragon family name get it in there. Um, he is, um, he's pretty good at chess. He's not really good at chess, right? Because to be really good at chess is pretty much impossible, mm-hmm. right? Like, like I, if I spent the rest of my life and my one thing was to be the best at chess, <laughs> I would fail, right. right? Like, yeah, there's, there's like, if you're older than eight, I'm sorry, <laughs> you're, you're, out. Out, you're out of the running. <laughs> You've got a you're, good luck next lifespan. Um, but my dad and I would play chess and, um, he, you know, I was six and he was in his fifties and so, or forties and he, he would kick my butt, he would kick my butt at chess every single time. 
uh, and absolutely demolish me over and over and over again. And I would play him over and over and over again. Um, and uh, my mom would be like, oh, won't you go easy on, you know, Jay? Like you're losing, you know, like you're winning over and over. And I'd be like, no, I don't want my dad to go easy on me. I want to win because the thing for me was it was not the joy of chess did not come from actually winning, right? Like actually winning was impossible, right? I was Sisyphus, <laughs> but yes. I, I was I was six year old Sisyphus pushing the boulder up the hill. But I really liked pushing boulders. <laughs> well, you, we, we must, must imagine Sisyphus, Sisyphus happy. Chess. Yeah. Yes. Oh my mm-hmm. God. Yes. And uh, yeah. you know, and and you succeeded there. And let me and let me tell you really quick when I did beat my che- when I did beat my dad at chess when I when I did get him best feeling of the world like nothing compares <laughs> i i uh, i've taught my boys we must imagine sisyphus happy i don't know mm-hmm. what they're going to grow up like because either either they're going to have so many advantages or they will be so just ostracized and unable to fit into society given the weird selection of of whatever i've i've made available to them i think i think we're a couple of weirdos who have been a little <laughs> ostracized society and i think we've done pretty all right yeah. so i'm not worried about your boys <laughs> but uh so we're they've created a fake sitcom called oh oh Dadalus. um like <laughs> uh, but anyway um uh i would play my dad with chess and he <sighs> very good at chess he had the right brain for it and Mm -hmm. you know he Mm -hmm. he got into the army which uh, that means something different now i think than then Mm -hmm. he got in uh, by his own admission in in a stupid Mm -hmm. way but luckily missed the vietnam Mm -hmm. war because of it because he was already in a different part of the army our dads are oddly similar yeah Yeah. (laughs) and so but when he was and again this isn't what i think of when i think of the army Mm -hmm. He played a yeah. lot of chess and got so that he he would hustle chess for money um, mm-hmm. a, among people. And this, again, hey, everyone, this was back before you could play a game on your phone. So if you mm-hmm. wanted to play a game, it was what you had the pieces for and they had chess. Mm-hmm. So um, and and when you play chess for money, it's for realsies. And um, but he and was, being a chess hustler is hard. Those are like they're good players. And yeah. and he was very good. And he would spot me two pieces of my choice, and mm-hmm. we would play. And I never beat him, but I still remember the night where I got. I I thought I had it. I thought I had it, and I did not have it. And and I was absolutely mm-hmm. crushed and so sad mm-hmm. and just broke. And and my dad was like. Mm-hmm. Oh, you know, and and again, I I like to think in that respect I have set my boys up because mm-hmm. sometimes they will play and but they'll also speak up and it's like and they'll see what's happening and one of them will say hey, I was planning on doing this over here and if you do this, I can't. You know, and that feels bad and I'm like, "Oh, good job saying so. Mm-hmm. Let's let's hold on for a second like you said." Mm-hmm. You know, just mm-hmm. do whatever you want, but then be willing to stop and make sure everyone like is okay. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, and then because we stopped, but again, he was like, I just like playing chess and I'm doing this with my boy. And of course you play to win mm-hmm. and I didn't expect anything different, but I did, I could not find the joy of a game well played and, mm-hmm. and that it, where I came close and then failed and it just ruined mm-hmm. me. And then of course he felt bad because he wasn't trying to make me sad or be mean. Yeah, he was doing yeah. a, doing a thing with his kid. So yeah, mm-hmm. it's um yeah. Um no, so I, I feel that. I feel that. Mm-hmm. I, I again I obviously I could happily talk with you forever. I do feel bad that I've <laughs> kept you longer than your appointed hour. Um so um, you know, I, I will say this. Uh first off, everyone. Uh, there is the Indiegogo going, Indiegogo going right now for uh, this awesome up and coming game. And just let me say, it's doing very nice. Congratulations. It's doing pretty nice. Thank you. Thank you. It's it's currently at a bit more than half a wander. It's almost two thirds of a wander home. So. Yeah. And so yeah. you can get in here. And as y'all already know, 
uh, getting in here really helps uh, a person who's looking to make a physical thing because mm -hmm. they get to judge order quantities. Um, a lot of, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm looking through here again with, with mm -hmm. covetousness in my heart. Um, but I'm also realize, yep. Some of these, there's the, all, this stuff is only going to be here in mm -hmm. the, in the mm -hmm. Indiegogo. So there's a, there's a plushie. If you're the kind of person who would like a, a plushie of a frog, oh. um, wearing overalls, there is a plushie that is exclusive to the Indiegogo. So um, um, if you want a sweatshirt of of the heartless witch Yazeba, there is yes. And as and as Kriggan points out in the chat, uh, Kickstarter has been having a lot of moral issues, which is a big part of why I went to Indiegogo, which has impacted our capacity to be explosive. Right, like if anything, we've seen Kickstarter certainly is a is the platform to be, but we're trying not to be there right now, which yeah. has impacted sales. So I will. I, I admire the hell out of you just to say because we're we're gearing up for some of our own projects and finding out that kicks i, I don't know what your beef is mine is mm -hmm. the nfts uh, i mm, i should not use the language here in this stream <laughs> that i intend to use mm -hmm, um mm -hmm. but so helping support a cool game that does cool things helping support somebody who is um you know you know, as as is clearly shown by the course of my career, I can afford to use lose a few readers by from on a moral stance. Um, but um, you know, it's harder when you have a whole game studio and you still make the ethical choice, even mm -hmm. though it's going to impact your ability to have the business, make the game, and everything. So mm -hmm. I'll just say, if you love good games, uh, if you know somebody who might enjoy this maybe pick it up for yourself, maybe pick it up for somebody else. Um, if you've already backed this and you're here because Jay is here, uh, but for some reason, see, it wouldn't make sense. Uh, there's also <laughs> Wander Home. I could not recommend more highly. You can buy that um, on their store or over. You can also, it's also an add on on oh. the Indiegogo, but yes. And also on your thing. Uh, yeah. I, Please I plug your thing. I grabbed mm -hmm. some copies for the world builders market um, and yes. so that's there. And so, mm -hmm. uh, um, you know, if you uh, want to give it a taste, but you feel a little more comfortable putting more of the money into charity, just because you don't know how good it is yet, but you will. And also, then... I I love you doing that. I think you should put more of the money into charity because that's good. <laughs> we are, yeah. That's just I. I'm not. I'm not like you're not taking money out of my pockets. The books. The books have been sent to Patrick. I want you to put the money towards charity. So actually do go to the world makers. Oh. Sorry, go there and get stuff, including Wander Home. And I'm sure there's a ton of other great stuff too. You said Wormwood Gaming is over there as well. Yeah, they so. they donate uh, for like our end of year stuff. And uh, um, and they've made like tax stuff and, and whatever, which is my version of chess. Because you're right, you can work on chess for for 30 years but it rewards meticulousness that i cannot mm -hmm. bring to bear uh whereas mm -hmm. tack is a game which i wish i had made but i did not um and there's some mm -hmm. beautiful wormwood stuff over there from tack um so how about this i will say um this has been great uh this you has know, been really wonderful thank you you know you know a ton of people and you ha already have a great team but I will say, if you ever need somebody to really write something slow and probably delay, if not entirely bottleneck your entire production <laughs> process, give me a call because um, I, I love Wander Home. Mm -hmm. And the thing mm -hmm. is, I know you don't need me, so this is a pretty safe offer for me to make. Um, but if you ever need a beardy, older author dude type, feel free to ping me. Um, I'm, I'm deeply, deeply appreciative. We should... I, I was mentioning a little bit of the the Wander Home expansion. I want to invite mm. folks to come do stuff with it in such a way that doesn't worry about delays as much. So I will message you because I have a lot of great writer friends who have ADHD and I like to <laughs> make the game. I like to, I like to plan around their lives. <laughs> Let's cool. just say. <laughs> cool. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's great. Again, thank you, yeah. Jay, so much for your time. Everybody, thank uh, you. go take a peek at 
the Indiegogo, take a peek at the beautiful stuff that, that Jay and, and his entire team have been involved with before. Um, and uh, yeah, I think, how yeah, about this? Thank you. I will, I will release you. Uh, should I shut the stream down? I should probably this, everybody. I think I will actually stop the stream and shut it down. I was going to maybe stick around with y'all and just hang out and talk some more. But given that this ran long, I should stop and actually do some of those emails. Um, <laughs> oh, God, me too. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so here we go. I will say thanks again, everybody. And take care, everyone. Yep. Take care of yourselves. Be careful and take care of the people you love. And I mm -hmm. will see you all soon. And boop. <laughs>